Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. What are we even doing? I don't know about you. Have you asked that question at least seven times this week? Uh, for Danielle and I, we've asked this question on multiple occasions this week as our daughter started preschool this week. And I don't know why you're cheering. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It was an amazing moment for us. And, and don't pray for my daughter. Pray for us, please. Uh, but just getting in the flow of pick up and drop off and uh, making sure that snacks and lunches are ready. And I'm like, what are we even doing? Somebody looked at me the other day. It was like, just, just, just so you know, she'll be graduating high school anymore. I said, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> but on a more serious note, last week, Pastor Q talked about that, that uh, when we ask the question, what are we even doing? It often stems from the fact that we didn't have a plan in place before we got going. Uh, we, we didn't have a vision. We, we, we didn't have next steps to execute. And scripture even points to this in Proverbs, makes a statement that where there is no vision, the people perish. Some of your translations read like this, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. He had a noise that went along with him. I'm going to try to do it today. He said, when, when we have no vision, we have no plan, our lives are just unraveling like, <laughs> just, 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 <laughs> it just takes three times. <laughs> just, we have no plan. We have no vision. Our lives are just unraveling. And as believers and followers of Jesus, uh, God desires that we walk according to the vision and the plan that he has for our lives. Pastor Q laid out for us last week that uh, one of those steps in that vision, in that plan, is that we would live a life that makes a difference. He dropped the line on us last week, and man, it just hit me in the heart. It said, uh, we won't really know the fulfillment in this life until we're living it to make a difference for God's glory. And this week, I just want to help us take the next step in this process, and we're going to discuss how you and I on a consistent basis can find freedom. I'll be real with you. Uh, I don't want to look free. I don't want to sound free. I don't want to act free. I want to be free. And the Jesus whom we say that we serve laid this out for us in the book of John. He said, the son, if the son sets you free, you'll be what? Free indeed. Which means there's no questions. There's no wishes. There's no hopes. Jesus has done the heavy lifting and the hard work and whom he has set free, is free indeed. Now there's moments in my life, like there's moments in your life where God helps you to encounter and experience his word in a very special and specific way. Uh, for me, it's connected to a story. I just want to share this story with you this morning here in the worship center and watching online. Uh, I went to work out at a gym that was outside of the city that I normally work out in. And, and how many know when you go to a new gym, there's just certain things that are different. And so uh, when, when I walked into the gym, the gym I'm used to has like multiple exits and multiple entrances. They got windows in different spots as well. I need to go use the bathroom. So I went to use the bathroom and this restroom in particular had no windows and only one exit in and one exit out. And so I go use the restroom. Great. Fantastic. Got in just fine as far as using the bathroom. Man, I go to leave the restroom and I pull the door, and I can't get out. Well, I step back, walked up again, I grabbed a handle, I pulled the door, try, couldn't get out. Now, it's at this point that we do the next sensible thing, like we pull out our phone. And my phone's got no service. Now, maybe I watched too many horror movies like Saw. <laughs> and so all I could think about in that moment is that little jigsaw puppet on a tricycle coming, rolling out to me, talking about, do you want to play a game? <laughs> <laughs> and just so we're clear, in the worship center, watching online, I'm black. Black. <laughs> 
And there's one thing we know about every horror movie. <laughs> the black guy dies first. <laughs> like, can't a brother make it past the first hour? Come on, somebody. <laughs> so stupid, sorry. <laughs> so I'm in this moment. I got no phone service. There's no windows. There's no doors. I can't get out. I'm freaking out. I'm starting, God, if you've ever gotten me out of something, I need you to get me out of this. Now you start praying every scripture. You know, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus, here we go. And once you know, I step back one more time. I grab the handle, and instead of pulling this time, what did I do? Bruh. <laughs> so while I walk away from this moment, I felt like God take me, took me back to this moment a few days later. I felt like this is what he nudged on my heart was, hey, so many times in our lives, in the quest for finding freedom, we're pulling on so many different things. We're pulling on so many different people. We're trying to fill voids and cracks and crevices in our lives, and we're, we're, we're pulling. We're trying to fill areas of depravity, and, and we're pulling. And God says, all I've asked you to do is what? Lean in and let me push you into the freedom that I have paid for you. I like how Bishop T.D. Jake says it. We've been called too high to live this low. There's no bondage that God has called us to live in any longer. We're, we're not slaves to sin any longer as children of a risen Savior and a conquering King. We, we've been called to walk in freedom and live in freedom because whom the Son sets free is what? Free, free indeed. I want to take a little bit of time this morning. I want to lay out three ways, three ways that we can find freedom, three ways we can find freedom. Uh, number, the first way, number one, point number one, real relationships is what we need because real relationships produce real results. Now, we all know what fake relationships look like. Because in most cases, what causes us to not want to engage in relationships anymore, especially real ones, is the pain we experience from fake ones. You know, there's a phrase we use in hip-hop culture, no new friends. Well, the reason why we don't want any new friends is because we didn't like the old friends we used to have. But I found there's, there's a couple ways that we can nurture real relationships, to have genuine communication. Uh, the first step uh, to having real relationships that produce real results is you have to nurture these relationships. If I told you that I only talk to my wife once a week or once a month or, God forbid, once a year, you look at me and say, you need to fix that immediately. But yet this is how we treat people that are close to us. We interact with them at our own comfort level. And when we feel we, like we have time, and how many know you never really have time, that's why you make time for the things that you want to make time for. I'm going to go talk to this side, okay? <laughs> it, re it requires nurture. It requires investment. It requires time. It requires actually getting real beyond the hi, how are you? Like, everybody needs a friend in their life that y'all walk by each other. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, but you know you're dying inside, and that friend picks up on it, and then they circle back to you five minutes later, and they look at you and go, how you really doing? Everybody needs that friend. And it requires a level of what? Nurture. The second thing that real relationships require, boundaries. Dr. Henry Cloud says that boundaries are the litmus test of relationships. If someone cannot respect the boundaries that you have set, then they do not qualify to have real relationship with you. Boundaries, guardrails, protection. Jesus lays this out for us so well in the fact that he called 12 and had real relationship with them, but he also had an inner circle of three that he got the closest to. Boundaries. I, I, I love this, in fact, because these boundaries apply to every real relationship that we have in our lives. 
if you want to know if someone has your best interest in mind, set a boundary. Like your single friends don't need to be involved in your marriage. <laughs> I'm gonna talk to this side, here we go, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Turn me up for the people in the back, let's go. Here's another one. Your mother doesn't need to be involved in your marriage either all the time. It's quiet in this church. I love it. I love it. Watch this. You can't lend money to everybody. Boundaries. Because we're not after the relationships that zap us. And too often we spend time investing ourselves into relationships that are not going to produce the fruit that God desires for us to experience. And we're frustrated with fake friends or we're frustrated in relationships that could be fruitful. But in these relationships that could be fruitful, we just didn't set boundaries. And as a result, we experienced the bondage of failed friendships and broken expectations. But Jesus says, I've come to unwind you from these things today as we lean in to real relationships. Step two in this process, which helps us to dig even deeper as we've talked about the horizontal relationships between us and peers and friends and family. Uh, step two in this process is understanding that change is where we find transparency. Change, change, change and transparency are connected. We talked about the relationships we have with one another horizontally, but in this instance now, let's go a level deeper and talk about the relationship we have vertically with our creator. Because the transparency that I'm talking about is us being honest with God about what we really feel, what we're really dealing with, and what we're really facing. And just so we're clear, there are moments in our lives where depending on our experience with religion or depending on our experience with the church or with God's people from time to time and sometimes the pain or the misunderstandings that we've accumulated, we often can look at God and feel like God could be embarrassed or God could be afraid to interact with parts of our lives that we don't want anybody else to know about. Like, God doesn't sit over here and go, hey, let me know when you're done. I'll come talk to you. God just wants us to be what? Open and transparent with him. I love how Pastor Chris Hodges, who's our pastor's pastor, talks about this. He says that God is not expecting perfection from us, but he does expect honesty. Yes. Like, if you're not going to be honest with anybody else, Take a moment the next time that you pray and really tell God what's going on in between your ears or in your heart. He's not afraid. If anything, I would dare to believe that your transparency is the key that opens the door to the change that you've been looking for. If you and I walk into the doctor's office and we know we're sick and there's evidence that we're sick, but the doctor looks at us and goes, what's wrong? And we go, <laughs> nothing. How transparent are we actually being? And in a case where the doctor now has to play a guessing game of what's wrong, understand something. They're operating from a place of information that you help them with and symptoms they can diagnose. But there's a reason why we can be transparent with God like nobody else, because God created us. And nobody knows us better than our creator. Scripture still says while we were in our mother's womb, he knew us. He knew how much hair we'd have on our head and the approximate date where we would begin to lose it. He knew <laughs> the beginning from the end. He was with us before the storm showed up. He was with us when the storm got here and he's going to be with us when the storm subsides. The creator of all is in all and working through all. Therefore, it's our responsibility to extend ourselves in transparency to him. Now, the reality is, is I'm very much like you, that there are often moments when I think of God that I kind of get like little kids do when they get caught by their parents. 
Like I was watching this veteran parent, because I'm a rookie, one kid, I'm a rookie, here we go. I was watching this veteran parent one day, and man, I had an Evernote out, I was taking notes, I was like, man, that's good, let's go. Here's what they did. Caught their, parent, caught their, caught their kid doing something, and you know the parent looked. And you know the kid looked. And the parent looked at the kid and said, what am I about to say? And the kid responded, and it was the wrong answer. I was like, oh, it's about to go down now. And the parent said something that changed the way I viewed the moment. They said, hey, try again. And the second time the kid got it right, I said, man, doesn't this sound like my relationship with God? That when I'm starting to think a certain kind of way, or when my actions don't match my beliefs, and I know God's watching me, and I lock eyes with him through his word, I'll look back and go. <laughs> but I feel like God's response is, hey, what am I about to say? And watch this, you'll never know what he's about to say if you haven't heard and read what he's already said. Okay? Like your identity, who you are, what he thinks about you and how he feels, it's not a mystery. It's wrapped up in that app you call the Bible app. It's wrapped up, for some of us still like flipping pages, it's wrapped up in that 66 books that we call the Bible, and he still says that you are the apple of his eye. He still says that you are the apex of his joy. He still says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He still says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, I'll raise up a standard against him. He still says no weapon formed against you will prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you will be condemned. He still says these things about you. So the next time guilt and shame get on each shoulder, I want you to turn up the volume of God's word because his word speaks back to us and says what? Try again. And be clear and transparent with him. How would your prayer life change if you walked into your prayer life talking to God like you talk to those other three friends in the group text? Uh-oh, you're getting holy on me now because it's Sunday. How would your prayer life change if instead of posting on Facebook, you just put your face in the book and found out what he said about you? Yeah. The change that we're looking for, it's found where? In transparency. So just try again. Because in our, in our trying again, watch this, my third point for today, third step to find freedom is understand that the Holy Spirit is the difference maker. You ought to just nudge the person next to you and just say, you really ain't that good. <laughs> Some of y'all enjoyed that way too much, just so you know. <laughs> if it's your spouse, it might be a long ride home. Here we go. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is the difference maker. When, when I say you're not really that good, it's not really an insult, it's just fact. That apart from the Holy Spirit, we're really not that good. Right. Like, 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 like some of us would have snapped on somebody this week, but God. Like, like some of us, we, we might have been missing a child this week, but God. Some of us were dealing with a boss that might be related to Satan, <laughs> but God. And it's the Holy Spirit that's the difference maker. Mm -hmm. Let me say it like this. Here's how you know that the Holy Spirit has been entered into a scenario and his presence is where you are. Is there freedom taking place? How do you know that? Look at what Corinthians says. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Now, let's just set a couple misnomers about the Holy Spirit straight right now. He is not the third watered-down version of God nor is he some weird mystical being that should show up on Stranger Things. When Jesus left this planet by way of ascension back into heaven, he says, I'm sending one behind you that's going to be with you until the very end of time. 
And the one I'm sending is known as the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will walk with you and be with you until the end of time. One of the most underrated promises in God's word is that we are never left and that we are never forsaken and the one who is always with us is the Holy Spirit. He knows you better than you know yourself. He understands why you're angry even when you don't and he knows what every single tear is when you shed it, even in the moments when you have no idea why you are still crying. He knows when you are happy. He knows when you're depressed. He knows when you're oppressed. He knows what you're going through, why you're going through it, and what the solution is when you have run out of options. The Holy Spirit is here not to make you a better version of you, but to breathe fresh air into your life every single day. We know need the Holy Spirit because he is the difference maker, not self-help, not self-medication, none of those things. It's the Holy Spirit that keeps us reeled in and keeps us on the path and in alignment with what God has for us. Jesus did no miracles himself until after Luke 3 when he was baptized in water and then filled with the Holy Spirit. The very beginning of Luke chapter four, it's not in your notes, but follow me for a second. Scripture says that Jesus then, full of the Holy Spirit, is led into the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days and for 40 nights. And at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, the devil shows up on the scene to tempt him. Ain't that just like the devil? That in your weakest moment, and I don't know if Jesus was like me, but when I'm hungry, I'm not a nice person to be around. But now, the Holy Spirit being the one that fills and energizes him, watch this, he overcomes every temptation that the enemy throws his direction. Can I pause just for a moment and say this? That while self-discipline is important and self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, notice it is a fruit of who? The Spirit. None of it is possible without the difference maker that is the Holy Spirit being invited into our lives on a day in, day out, moment by moment basis. When you and I get a phone call on our phones, we have two choices. What? Accept or decline. Accept or decline. If it's my wife, accept. If it's a number I don't know, decline. <laughs> accept, decline. Accept, decline. Accept, decline. And I believe this is how the Holy Spirit injects himself into our lives. That we have a choice every single day. Am I going to accept when he calls or am I going to what? Decline. And often there are moments in our lives where we understand that if we hit accept, we give that relationship a chance to grow and deepen. But at some point, if we keep hitting decline, we just get in the rhythm and the routine of living our lives without that relationship being a part of our lives. He's not here to condemn. He's not here to criticize. He's not here to make you feel less of what God called and created you to be. No, 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 no. He's here to be invited into your life and into your space so that the same power that Jesus had to overcome temptation when you hit accept on that call, you have access to it as well. Now watch this. There are moments because Jesus was the only perfect person to ever walk the planet, past, present, or future. And there are moments where you and I fall flat on our face. Like when somebody cuts you off. And we walk away and we go, man, I know. I, I know I shouldn't have said that. I know I shouldn't have done that. I know, I know. Believers and followers, that's not just simple intuition. That is the Holy Spirit nudging your heart and saying, I'm still with you. Try again. I'll never leave you. Try again. 
I'll never forsake you. Try again. And there is nothing you can do, Scripture says, to separate you from the love and the presence of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the difference maker. So Jesus now, being full of the Holy Spirit, leaves the wilderness after overcoming temptation. And his first thought is to the local synagogue or the local church. Now understand, we see Jesus and know him, and this week we talked about Palm Sunday and about how we cry Hosanna because he is our Savior, and next week we're going to celebrate all across six different services here at the chapel, the risen Savior that is Jesus. This is how we see him, but when he walks into the synagogue in Luke chapter 4, they just see him as Joseph's boy, the son of a carpenter. Now he's a rabbi, but he's got no pedigree. They got a little prejudice going on. And Jesus walks right through that bondage. He walks up to the scroll and he turns it to Isaiah chapter 61. And now, full of the Holy Spirit, gives them a quick message on the mission of why he's here. In Isaiah 61, he says, the spirit of the Lord is where? Upon me now, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus says, I've come not just full of the Holy Spirit for me, but I've come led by the Holy Spirit so that I can begin to lead people into the freedom that my God, my Father designed for them to have. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it the way that I meant it, seeing what you previously couldn't see, overcoming what you previously couldn't overcome, and experiencing life in it. It's fullness. And then to my favorite part of this entire story, because y'all know I like clapping. And then it says he closed the book. He closed the book. Understand there's some significance behind this. Because to this point, nobody else had the authority to close this book. Because closing the book signified that scripture had been fulfilled. So in this moment now, Jesus is declaring, you have been reading this for hundreds of years, but today is the day when you can now walk in the freedom that's been prophesied and declared for hundreds of years. And Jesus closes the book to let them know I'm here and it's on and popping. Can I just tell you this morning that there There are things that you have been fighting in your life that Jesus said, don't fight them another day because I have closed the book. When fear whispers to your spirit again, hear me this morning, remember Jesus has already what? close the book. When stress wants to cause you to have all kind of physical ailments, remember that Jesus has already closed the book. When the whispers of divorce try to creep themselves into your home, just remember that Jesus has already what? close the book. When selfishness and pride don't want to let you go, you remind selfishness and pride whom the Son has set free is free indeed because my Savior showed up on the scene and close the book. I'm just looking for a few people in here this morning that understand the power of what it means when Jesus closes the book. He's here. He's with us. Strengthening us, empowering us by his spirit to live a life from a closed book perspective. Oh, you'd stop tripping over some of the stuff you're tripping on. Letting insomnia get the best of you. 
letting your past whisper to you way too much. Letting insecurity have too much space. Mm -hmm. But next time it starts, remind him. My Savior stepped on the scene with a gangster lean and plays no games. And he what? Close the book. Let me say this. Let's land this plane. We all have a choice this week of what we're going to do with the word we've heard today. We're going to leave here excited and thankful and in worship for a God who has closed the book. But let me encourage you with this. Please don't try to reread chapters that Jesus has already closed the book on. No, don't flip those pages. Remember that he who was faithful to begin a good work is faithful to what? Complete it. And he wants to complete it with you giving him permission to lead to guide, to direct, and develop you in any and every situation. What are we even doing? We're finding freedom. We're walking in freedom. Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Let me pray for you this morning. Jesus, thank you so much that your word is just as powerful today as it was the moment that it was penned. And we choose to walk in that confidence, in that courage, and in that freedom that you provide, not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. Tether us to your word, anchor us to it, both now and forevermore. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray.